do new buildings for Energy Star certification. So we're moving that along. A couple of new initiatives we wanted to talk about. Um, so again, we're trying to get out the information to these buildings um, in ways that they can understand it and in a timely manner. So this year with compliance, we have uh, we have decided to um, not only just send them a, a, an email saying they have complied. We're trying to give them some information um, about what that means and what their scores mean and what does that mean in the context of of the buildings um, that are, are so the, the context of um, the benchmarking marking over the time of the ordinance or the time of the policy. Um, so we'll be providing that. And then um, we also wanted to know that there's been benchmarking interest beyond just the 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 um, the, con the, um, the the ordinance itself or the old um, so the commercial ordinance. We've had some interest from uh, two. Uh, so a an owner of two 100 unit multifamily buildings um, in benchmarking itself on wanting to get some resources and help um, uh, to do that. And then there have been interests from some buildings who um, are not currently benchmarking, um, but in order to qualify for the largest um, uh, green business cost share, they must be benchmarking. And so we have set up a, a, a method in which they can voluntarily benchmark and then um, qualify for larger uh, grants through that. So why aren't they currently benchmarking? Are they too small? Did I, uh, Correct, okay. they don't have to comply. Mm -hmm. So that is all the information that we have and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I see some questions, Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One question I had was, um, do you know the average Energy Star score of a new building in Minneapolis? Are they always? Close to 100, or is there a variation? Um, we there haven't been many buildings that have come online that we have yet benchmarked um, because the ordinance um, uh, says that no building has to benchmark that is um, younger than two years. All of the like new downtown east buildings have not yet been benchmarked, and so we we don't know. I ask because I'm curious if if not if there are standards that we want to put in place for future for new buildings to help encourage or require them to be more energy efficient. So just kind of an open question for staff as that moves forward. Um, and then I wondered if, um, yeah, I'd love to hear more. Uh, thank you, Chair Gordon, um, Councilmember Bender. Uh, traditionally, when, um, uh, when buildings first come online, when a new building um, becomes operational, what you tend to see is that buildings actually use more energy, essentially they have a lower energy star score um, than what perhaps is modeled or predicted. Um, uh, Katie and I actually both independently worked at an energy modeling firm before this, and this is something that um, we um, saw very often. I think the Whittier Clinic actually is, is perhaps a good example of that, that oftentimes the, um, the operations of a building haven't been uh, properly worked out and taught um, to be most energy efficient. Um, also, there's uh, many computer control systems, and those may not have been set up properly. So you may um, find buildings running uh, a snowmelt system 24-7, 365, and it often takes a few years to find those issues. And I think benchmarking is a great way uh, to bring those issues to light. Uh, often you do see that also uh, individuals that are paying the power bills, or rather electricity or natural gas bills, are not necessarily the individuals and organization that are in charge of their, um, uh, that are in charge of uh, facilities management. So you may have an account person paying an electric and natural gas bill, but that information may not get to a facilities person. And I think the benchmarking ordinance has helped um, has helped those individuals talk more to each other and find those issues in new buildings. And we would expect that to continue as these new buildings come online. Do you have another question? I'm also curious staff's perspective on expanding our ordinance to smaller square foot buildings at this time since we've had the experience so far. I'm sure that was part of the original discussion, but. Actually, since I'm not staff, I would like to <laughs> 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 uh, I think uh, there, right now, uh, um, I was not at uh, working at the city when the original ordinance was set and the uh, thresholds of 20,000 and 50,000 square feet were set, but I know that there was an analysis done at the time, and I think that the Part of that analysis was that you want to ret you want to uh, maximize the number uh, the amount of square footage you you cover in the city while minimizing the actual number of buildings that are affected. Um, so as we would decrease the square footage threshold, 
uh, we would start to then bring in a, a larger and larger number of facilities um, proportionally. Um, there obviously is a lot of savings in those um, buildings as well, but I think that becomes a, um, a public policy discussion as you reach uh, more buildings um, seeking uh, greater energy savings. Kind of a little a note to that as well. Um, there are other, so as the map show that there are many other cities in the country that do have benchmarking and they, the smallest threshold or the lowest threshold that I have seen as far as square footage is about 10,000. Council Member Glidden. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. And I did have a question, but I might actually kind of pop in on a couple of council member um, vendors questions just because some of the things that she has raised as questions are actually items that um, are kind of, I think, in the big bucket of policy options that have been uh, discussed with staff and some policymakers, including myself. Um, and uh, as an author of the um, uh, benchmarking ordinance, um, you know, I think we just tried to, to pick sort of a, a spot, <laughs> just one of those logical spots uh, that matched some other ordinances around the country, but also uh, we were mindful that once you got below a certain size of building, you were talking really about a resource issue, uh, resource on behalf of the city, um, to do the kind of outreach that would be necessary and then resource on behalf of the building owners, you know, how were you going to educate them? So trying to figure out what was the right place to start. Um, staff has actually brought up the idea of um, uh, lowering that threshold. Um, and I think the question ends up being, is that where we want to spend, because we'll need more resources to lower the threshold? Is that where we want to spend our resources? or other places because we've also talked about residential benchmarking and other types of impactful programs. Um, a second thing is that in our um, list of priorities um, for the Clean Energy Partnership, we also have talked about potentially an ordinance that uh, would mirror the system in St. Paul where they do have a, kind of a matrix, I guess it is, of options when there are new buildings that are built that have some amount of city resource in them. It could be a very small amount of city resource that in the end encourage them to have a certain amount of energy efficiency. So that's another thing that we are looking at in Minneapolis um, to continue to expand um, our reach. I was curious about the um, uh, slide that you presented that showed um, that we were really about steady in terms of the private buildings, um, in terms of um, where they were at with energy efficiency. And um, I was curious if you had a theory about why that was, and maybe in part that's because we're still kind of tracking multiple year data on larger buildings and haven't really reached smaller buildings where some of the energy efficiency practices might be more new to them. but. Just curious if you have a theory. Sure, Gordon Councilmember Glidden. Uh, I think uh, I believe this is a slide you're referring to here. Um, one of the things that I think uh, should be mentioned too, and actually I was just at a, um, a conference, energy efficiency conference, and this came up amongst uh, municipalities that um, with a benchmarking ordinance, um, you start to see greater results, greater energy efficiency and more energy savings um, as more years have passed. For instance, here you're just showing two years of data. And in reality, um, the 2014 data, for instance, here the first data point, that data is actually being collected and analyzed by both our team as well as then the buildings in the year 2015. So a substantial amount of 2015 has actually already elapsed before, um, before any action can be taken. Um, so I think that you actually need to see a longer time horizon to start seeing uh, larger results here. Um, as well as then, I think, again, to the Whittier Clinic of, of the snowmelt system, that's a relatively simple uh, action to take. Um, that's really a computer controls action where you need to change when that snowmelt system operates. But in, in many buildings where they're operating, um, their energy efficiency is perhaps more driven by uh, the types of windows they have, the perhaps existing incandescent lights, 
those types of upgrade projects to new windows to LED lights take multiple years. It takes years to both um, to develop the capital as well as then to find subcontractors and actually perform the rep, the work. So in many of those cases, you actually see that there needs to be a longer time horizon before more substantial deep energy savings can be seen um, in many buildings. Thank you. Um, so I was wishing that we already had 2016 uh, information. Why does it take so long? And why, I mean, we're in 2017 now and we're looking at 2015 and you're just talking about we could see more years. Um, so uh, from my perspective and maybe the public, it's like, well, what happened last year? Did it go down? Did it go up? That when will we know? Chair Gordon, that's a great question. Um, so the so for 2016 data um, that they are not the buildings are not required to submit their data until June 1st, and so um, and even after after June 1st, there are um, buildings have at least two extensions that they can apply for, and um, and so we work with them to try to uh, you know work with them to comply as well as they can so um, and verify the data. So we won't even get anything from them until June. Correct. Um, and the reason for that lag is because uh, there, the way that utility bills come in. Typically, you're not going to get a utility bill on December 31st of last year. You're going to get it maybe in January or even February. And so um, we need to get, provide a little bit of lag time so that buildings could collect all of the utility bills for that full calendar year. Um, and then also give them enough uh, leeway to um, for you know, time to just collect everything together. It does seem to me that if we had more cooperation, because I suspect CenterPoint and Excel might know the energy usage before June, um, and the, to to actually bill for it, which because they're probably billing right there in January for December's usage. So, um, so it's um, <clears throat> maybe one of our aspirational dreams could be that we get better, more timely information for everybody, so that we can share that. Um, and that's something we can maybe work on at the Clean Energy Partnership and elsewhere. Chair Gordon, I am happy to also say that Excel's um, new benchmarking tool has been a phenomenal help um, to, to these benchmarking buildings. I've heard a lot of uh, buildings say like, oh, it is so much easier now that Excel has this automated data transfer tool um, that allows us to comply much faster, much easier. And water usage is also part of this? Water usage is also and part of this. What's the utility company that provides that? City of Minneapolis. Uh, are we, maybe we could help uh, uh, mimic Excel's benchmarking uh, work so that we could, are, are we as good as they are yet? The City of Minneapolis util water utility does not have an automated data transfer tool. Okay. <laughs> Chair so, Gordon, also, um, as Katie mentioned, Excel has the automated data transfer tool. Um, through the Clean Energy Partnership work, uh, CenterPoint Energy has committed to building a data aggregation tool that will uh, substantially automate that process as well. So I think that will um, help reduce the barriers to uh, more timely data uh, collection and reporting. Wonderful. Um, Councilmember Fry. Oh, okay. Um, well, I really appreciate the report. I did notice that, the, that in the report there's several um, properties or buildings that don't have an Energy Star rating yet. Um, I was also, just noted that lots of, our, of them are at zero or four or three. And so it seems like there's probably a lot of progress we could make with those ones. Maybe you could just note that we're still waiting for some information on some buildings to give them their rating. Is that why it's missing? Chair sure, Gordon, council members, uh, I'm happy to answer that. So um, not all buildings can earn an Energy Star score and that is based on their property type. Um, just the way portfolio manager operates, there are only about 20 property types that can earn a score. Um, and those are typically the most, um, ubiquitous properties uh, in the U.S. So offices, K through 12 schools, hospitals, you know, the very common ones, but your police stations, your fire stations, um, libraries, those are not going to have uh, okay. energy star schools. So then it's not as useful as maybe it could be to have that the rating. Mm -hmm. uh, now people have to actually dig into the other numbers to see how well they're doing. No, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other questions or comments. Thank you so much. This is always very interesting and it's um, already posted online so people can, can see the full report there and the information. Yes. Check on their favorite properties. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. I will move to receive and file that report then. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And that motion carries. And now for our final item.
and thanks so much for your patience uh, waiting. We're going to have our um, report on our youth violence prevention results. We have some indicators that we've been tracking, and we'll be uh, joined by Ms. Sasha Cotton. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having us, Chair Gordon, and to the committee. We are really pleased to be here. Um, we were asked to present some preliminary data for the 2016 results on the results of Minneapolis Youth Violence Prevention Report. Excuse me, report. That was a long sentence. Um, and are here to provide that data. Um, Rick Carlson from our epidemiology team, research and evaluation, is going to provide the data. And then our staff is here to take any questions about content. So I'll turn it over to Rick. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Gordon and Council members. Uh, my name is Rick Carlson. I work at the Minneapolis Health Department. I'm an epidemiologist with the city. Uh, today, we're going to give you an update on data. In November of 2016, we published a report called the 2015 Youth Violence Prevention Report. Um, this was presented as part of a results Minneapolis process. It is a multi-department effort. For example, the Minneapolis Police Department the Minneapolis Health Department, the City Coordinator's Office, the Youth Coordinating Board, many others all come together and help submit data for indicators that we track over time. One of the important things to note about this report is that we present numeric data. You won't see uh, rates, you won't see uh, numbers divided by any sort of population or subpopulation. And that is important. It's always important to track numbers. In public health, we call it burden, how many people are affected. It's oftentimes important when you are striving toward uh, a zero number, uh, like with sudden infant death, for example, or with motor vehicle traffic, youth violence prevention, uh, youth violence is preventable, and it is a towards zero effort. So this presentation includes updated data on the following areas, homicides, uh, uh, violent crime victims, injuries, arrests, violent crime involvement, there are nuances to each one of these categories, and please feel free to ask me questions as we go along. And then one that isn't specifically youth violence, but is more environmental tracking, is sounds of shots fired. Uh, this presentation will really capitalize on three sources of data, and I do have to talk about some of the nuances related to these sources. Two of the sources that you see on this um, table are related to resident data. One is vital records, that's deaths and births. It's an administrative data source. We geocode uh, uh, decedents, residents at the time of their death. Um, for birth, data as well. For moms uh, giving birth to new babies, we geocode their residents to the city of Minneapolis. On the third row, you'll see hospital data. That is received on behalf of a standardized data set from the Minnesota Hospital Association. That does say preliminary 2015 on there. Just like the first row, which says 2015, um, that's the most up-to-date data that we have. But that hospital data is also based upon residents. The row in the middle, where I put the blue star next to, is police data. A majority of this presentation is police data, um, and it is, however, updated through 2016. Uh, the police department worked very hard to get it. It is location-based, so please interpret uh, that data as something uh, as uh, events that happened in Minneapolis. That's a very important distinction. An overview of the findings quickly uh, as I go through the slides quickly is that many of the indicators that you see with police data, for example, as well as one that you see with vital records, homicides, are up. There are a few that are continued trends downward. Things like simple assault arrests and arrests with a gun among youth. Uh, all of these are among youth. And then also our two hospital data source indicators, which are injury related, either assault or firearm related assault, are also continued uh, trends down. Uh, a very important note here is that our violence prevention efforts in the city will always have a greater impact on residents. So keep in mind when you're thinking prevention, it's oftentimes resident focused. Now, also keep in mind that you're going to see a lot of police data that's based upon location, and those are all uh, trends upward. Youth homicides. Uh, for youth homicides, we're going to start with the vital records data. Uh, so this is death data. 
And what we see here is that homicides among youth residents, um, these are ages 24 and under, uh, were high in 2015 relative to prior years. We only have data up to 2015, uh, but we have 17 total deaths in that uh, last data point. Homicide is a rare event, but what you can see here in that 2015 data point is that you had 17 overall, and it affected all three of the different uh, age breakdowns that uh, we put the data into, which is typically young adults, ages 18 to 24. That's a kind of tan shaded uh, piece of the bar. There were 12 of those in uh, 2015. The light blue is juveniles, ages 10 to 17, and there were four of those. Uh, you can also see as you go across the rows um, back into prior years what those numbers used to be. Uh, for children ages 0 to 9 in the uh, previous uh, years, 2012, 13, and 14, we had 0, but in 2014, uh, 2015, we did have one homicide among residents, youth residents. It's also in, two, in uh, 2012, we had 0 juveniles, um, it, and 17 is the um, just to note, it's um, the second highest it's we've had. So do we have the number for 2016 now? Yes, I do have it on police data, not on vital records data. So this is based on deaths among residents, but I do have it on police data and it'll, it, it'll be compelling as well. Okay. Uh, this next slide is also based upon deaths, uh, but you'll see the same numbers here overall, but what you'll see is the ones that are firearm related. This is either firearm related as the underlying cause of death or as a contributing cause of death. But you can see that proportionally, most of them are firearm related if they are uh, youth homicides. In fact, over the last 10 years, about 81% of them are firearm related. And this last slide, uh, Chair Gordon, uh, is police data. And what you can see with this one is it's homicides as well, but these are location-based homicides. Uh, still the same indicator, but happening in Minneapolis, regardless of residency. And we do have a 2016 data point here. If you look at this uh, figure, you'll see that location-based youth homicides were high in 2015 and 2016 relative to prior years, with 24 and 17 deaths per year, respectively. When I look at this figure, I look at those final two bars relative to all the prior years. It is a bit hard to interpret um, numbers of rare events like this when they go up and down and up and down based upon a single year. Um, so sometimes you have to look at groupings. So what was it in 2000? I noticed 2006 is missing now, but that was the high on the, the last one. Do we don't know the 2006 police, you know, location based homicides? We do. Um, in fact, I can is pull it, that up for you. Is it higher than 24? <clears throat> I typically pull 10 years of data to be the most relevant, but from the previous report. I just know we always talk about 2006 as being such a, a high watermark and. Um, 2006, uh, uh, Chair Gordon was 29. With 20 among young adults, six among juveniles and three among children. So you are right in fact as it being a very high year. Okay, well, we gotta get this down, okay? Yes. So we're going to look at youth crime victims here. We have uh, several other domains to go through. Uh, the number of violent crime victims increased in 2015 and 2016. Uh, this is also Minneapolis police data. The increase was evident among young adults and children, but not juveniles. So what you see there is that last data point uh, from the 1600s uh, rising up to 1820 there. And gunshot victims are a subset of violent crime victims. Uh, the number of gunshot victims among youth increased in 2015 and 2016, and it affected all age groups. So you can see in uh, 2014 is 104, 2015, 130, and 2016, 170. Again, Minneapolis police data. Does, does the gunshot victims include homicides? That were... It may include homicides, okay. yes. Uh, youth injury data. Youth injury data is our hospital data. This is the data that I referenced that has been on a continued downward trend. This is among uh, residents and um, selected hospital systems who participate in submitting data uh, to the Minnesota Hospital Association. So it's very much so in in-care population. 
uh, injury data among youth residents uh, based on hospital data. Historically, um, the assault injuries based upon this data have declined among youth residents. You can see our most recent data point being uh, 1,132 and downward from previous years. So I'm assuming that all our major Minneapolis hospitals and the suburban areas participate in this? That's true. Okay. Uh, other information on participating hospitals is available on the uh, Minnesota Hospital Association's website. Chair Gordon. Uh, in terms of firearm related assault injuries, this is a subset of all assault injuries. Uh, again, uh, hospital data. But what we see there is that they've continued a downward trend and they've really plateaued around the 60s, mid 60s. So we're not necessarily seeing the same thing here as we see with the police data. Youth arrests. I'm getting back to uh, uh, police data here. So arrest data is very unique as compared to uh, other things that you have seen in this presentation. Simple assault arrests among youth continue to decrease. It's evident uh, uh, across all youth age groups. That includes uh, young adults, juveniles, and children, those three uh, typical age groups that you saw from the previous slides. However, if we look uh, at aggravated assault arrests, from 27, uh, 2007 to 2013, aggr aggravated assault arrests among youth decreased uh, from 383 to 226. In 2015 and 2016, however, these arrests were again near or above the 300 mark. In 2015, it was 310. 2016 is 291. And our last arrest related data uh, indicator is arrest with a gun. Arrest with a gun among youth continue to decrease. Uh, this is evident across all age groups. So really the only upward trend that you saw was that previous slide with regard to aggravated assault arrests. And we're getting to our final indicators here, but youth violent crime involvement. You saw something like this before, but youth violent crime involvement uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're a victim. It might mean that you are an arrestee. A perp uh, you might be a uh, perpetrator, for example. You might be a witness. And then we have this other category called other. And I'm going to read from that. The other role may include people who were present or associated with the incident. They may have been affected by the violent crime, crime, but were not directly involved or victimized. So this is the way the Minneapolis Police Department typically categorizes things uh, over time with regard to the violent crime involvement. And these numbers are going to be, be very, very much so higher. But it's also a very powerful indicator in that manner. And what you see with violent crime involvement among youth is that it was higher in 2015 and 2016 relative to these prior years. You kind of see a return on that trend line. Uh, when we look at these three categories of arrestee, witness, other for violent crime involvement, and we then break it down among young adults and juveniles and children, it holds true for young adults ages 18 to 24 years. And juveniles, ages 10 to 17 years, and children ages 0 to 9 years. And I just want to point out that graph, that figure, because when you have it spilling over into children like that, that's usually not a very good thing, especially from a health department's perspective. We see that the 2015 data point is 183, and the 2016 data point is 243. And finally, we have this environmental tracking indicator. This is not limited to youth, but it helps give us a fuller picture of what's happening in the environment. And so for the sake of this, we oftentimes uh, overlie it with a couple of the trend lines. So, for example, youth place-based homicides and youth gunshot victims are also on this figure. And it's a split y-axis. But what you see with regard to reported sounds of shots fired in Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis police data, that they increased from uh, 2,736 in 2015 to 3,358 uh, in 2016. The number of youth gunshot victims rose and youth homicides did not between those two years.
And so again, our overview of findings is that you see many uh, police indicators there that are uh, on an upward trend. A few related to uh, arrests and hospital uh, uh, data that are on a continued downward trend. And that's all. I'm uh, sure that the PowerPoint will be put on the agenda. I was curious about if the results Minneapolis report on youth violence prevention is posted online yet. I had trouble finding it on the uh, website anywhere. And I'm not sure if it's in the health department side or the coordinator side. And so if we could possibly um, link to that, even uh, get it on our agenda, if you could send that to the clerk or to me, that might be really helpful for people who want to dig in a little bit more deeply. And I know we've gone kind of long. I used to have one short thing to that I was thinking about as I was looking at these numbers, that the population of the city has been going up. Um, I think a lot of us think that there are maybe more young people living in the city now than there were um, in 2008 or seven or something like that. Um, so that might be something that we want to look at is, is per, you know, per, per, cat, per population or, or what, are, what is that? If, um, although it's hard not to get uh, pretty upset and pretty concerned about some of those numbers and think we've got to dig down again. I mean, for a while we had such a nice trending down um, uh, and obviously there's m too many guns and there's too many people using guns and it's such a serious problem that um, I don't want to gloss over it but I any other questions or comments anybody okay sorry we couldn't all right yes in that case I guess Thank I'll you. move to receive and file the report all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed uh, that carries then and with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.